Hi, I'm Ralph Preston. It's Tuesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and here we are again doing another Stroke Buddy Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. This time we have Dr. Hetzler for the sixth time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hetzler, for sharing all your knowledge with us. We really do appreciate it. And to, today, Dr. Hetzler is going to do a little uh, presentation on memory after stroke. And if you have any questions, you can uh, ask them during his presentation, if you'd like. Um, and if not, you can save them till the end, or we'll have a little uh, discussion after. And uh, without further ado, I guess I'll just turn it over to Dr. Hetzler. Well, thank you, Ralph. It's my pleasure to be back here again. I enjoy discussing things with the people in this group, and I hope I can provide some useful information for you. So I'm going to uh, put on, hopefully, a, a PowerPoint, and I'll talk about it then okay here we go stroke of memory now most people uh don't realize that a stroke doesn't leave you with just physical limitations a stroke often leads to short-term memory loss in fact about one-third of stroke survivors find they have short-term memory problems short-term memory is information that a person is currently thinking about or is aware of. It's also called primary or active memory. Recent events and, mem and sensory data, like sounds, are stored in short-term memory. Short-term memory often encompasses events anywhere from about 30 seconds to several days. Short-term memory can occur anywhere from five to nine items. The research shows it's seven plus or minus two. So that's how you get five to nine. New information can bump out other items from short-term memory. Long-term memory, in contrast, has a much greater capacity and contains things like facts, personal memories, and the name of your third grade teacher. Mm -hmm. I remember third grade. Those were the four best years of my life. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Short-term memory loss. When a person experiences short-term memory loss, he or she can remember incidents from 20 years ago, but may have difficulty remembering something that happened 20 minutes ago. Where is short-term memory located? Well, different parts of the brain handle the different stages of memory. Short-term memory initially takes place in the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex, and I will show you where that is in just a minute. Then the information makes a stopover in the hippocampus. It is in the hippocampus that the memories are actually formed. They are then transferred to other areas of the cerebral cortex involved in language and perception for long-term permanent storage. But the memories themselves are formed in the hippocampus. And what did the hippocampus say in his retirement speech? Thanks for the memories. <laughs> okay, you're looking here at the left side of the brain. What you're actually looking at is called the cerebral cortex. Cortex means bark. And just like the bark of a tree, is on the outside. The cortex of the brain is on the outside. In that regard, how can you tell that a tree is a dogwood tree? By its bark. <laughs> Next slide. This again is the left side of the brain. Now, the brain is normally not color coded, but nicely it is here. On the left side, you can see the frontal lobe that's in blue. Then behind that, you can see the parietal lobe uh, that controls, or actually, that's where you receive 
your body senses. So pressure, pain, touch, warmth, cold, are all sensed in the somatosensory cortex. And down below that, you see the temporal lobe in green. That's where you hear things, but it's actually on the inside of the temporal lobe that the hippocampus is located. And the back of the brain, sort of a purple color, is the occipital lobe. That's where you see things. You can't actually see something until it reaches the occipital lobe at the back of your brain. Now this shows again the left side of the brain with the outside of the temporal lobe removed. You can see the hippocampus there. It's identified at the bottom uh, left-hand side and you can see uh, an orange shape. That's where the hippocampus is located. In terms of where it's located in your head, it's just above your ear and about an inch and a half inside the brain. You have a hippocampus on each side of your brain. Hmm. And again, it's just above your ear, about an inch and a half inside. I would assume they're connected? Uh, yeah, well, there is a... Uh, pathway that interconnects them yes they, they function separately or together well they usually <laughs> function together if both of them are damaged you can't form any new memories wow so you'll have all your old memories but no new memories can be formed Long or short term, I take it. You can't form any new long term verbal memories. That is things you can talk about. Okay. The, most, the most famous patient in all of neuroscience is identified by his initials HM. In the 1950s, he was having seizures. And in order to eliminate his seizures, the hippocampus could not be, it was removed surgically from both sides of his brain. After that, he could not form any new verbal memories. That wow. if, if you met him, you could introduce yourself, say, hi, my name is Ralph. He'd say, hi, Ralph. If you left his room and came back, 15 minutes later, he would have no memory of ever having met you before. Oh, wow. Now, he could learn to do physical things like ride a bicycle, but he would have no verbal memory of having done it. That is, if you asked him if he could ride a bicycle, he would say no, because at the time of the surgery, he could not. But if you gave him a bicycle, he could ride it. So he could learn new motor memories, but he would have no conscious verbal memory of having done so. Okay. Now, in terms of types of memory, uh, your memory is the ability to take in, store, and retrieve information, and there are different types. Short-term memory helps you recall information from the recent past. Your long-term memory recollects things from years ago. Now here's a simple diagram, a model of memory. On the far left-hand side, you have your sensory memory. Okay, various stimuli go in there, like things you're seeing or hearing or touching. The sensory memory has a very short duration of a second or two. When you pay attention to something in your sensory memory, it Move to short-term memory, abbreviated STM. You have to pay attention to it. If you don't, you forget it. It's gone forever. You can also forget from short-term memory. Rehearsal helps you retain information in short-term memory. So saying something over and over and over again 
helps you remember it. It has to be transferred to long-term memory, abbreviated LTM, if you're going to remember it days, weeks, months, or years later. In order for you to talk about it, though, you have to retrieve it from long-term memory. When it gets back into short-term memory, mm. then you can talk about it. Mm. For example, right now, you probably are not thinking about your middle name. But now that I mentioned it, you're retrieving it from long-term memory into your short-term memory where you could talk about it. Ralph, what is your middle name? Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, my mother's maiden name. Ah, I bet that was your mother's maiden name. It was. None of a god. I'm a psychic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, things get um, transferred to long-term memory, or I'm not sure if I have the right term, packed or whatever. That happens in uh, um, in your sleep, uh, correct? That well, you it, sleep does promote storage. In long-term memory, yes. So if you want things, if you want to remember things, sleep is also an important um, factor here. That is correct. In fact, uh, there's a classic study in psychology where college students learn some material that they either went to sleep or went about their daily activities. Hours, days, and weeks later, those students that went to sleep for several hours remembered it much better than those that just went about their daily activities. So much for staying up all night cramming, huh? Yeah, that's a waste of time. That's stupid. Yeah, it is, actually. If you, you want to remember, you, memory, don't. you need a good night's sleep. That will allow the memory to consolidate. That's the term. Yes. Wait a minute. Yes. If there's a person that go to sleep and you have, you said this is a short-term memory situation. If you yeah. have a dream, how can they remember the dream if it's short-term? <laughs> well, dreaming is something different. You typically dream five times a night, but you only remember the one you wake up from in the morning. The earlier four dreams you have no memory of in the morning. We're not talking about dreams here. We're talking about normal learning when you're trying to memorize something, uh, a new zip code, let's say, or a new telephone number. You need to, to help put in long-term memory. You want to rehearse it. Say it over and over. Um visual things worked as well as auditory, like um, looking at something over and over again, as opposed to saying it over and over again. Any, any type of repetition, I would think, would be helpful. Yes, or visualizing would be helpful. So. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. Because I'm a visual person, so I often like look at stuff and take little pictures of it, kind of try and memorize it. Yes. Look, would a foreign language situation fall into this category? Hmm. Uh, foreign language, yes. Uh, if you want to learn it, you have to re rehearse it. You have to read it or say it out loud or say it mentally. Okay, so that's a memory model. Now, we can also talk about memory in another way. When you remember what your neighbor looks like, and where you live, you're using your visual or spatial memory. When you remember that your wife told you to buy milk, you're using your verbal memory. When you practice a skill, you're using a motor memory. Now we could talk about memory in another way. And I alluded to this when I talked about patient HM. We could talk about declarative versus non-declarative memory. A declarative memory is a memory that can be verbally expressed, like a memory for events in your past. You can talk about what you did yesterday or what you ate yesterday. Non-declarative memory is memory you can't 
talk about, but you still conform it. Hmm. Uh, Non-declarative is a collective term for perceptual memory. If you're remembering an image, a stimulus response memory. Uh, for those of you with a background in psychology, this would be what's called classical conditioning. This is what Pavlov did with his dogs. Okay. That is, he would uh, feed them, and uh, if he put food in their mouth, they would salivate. Now, what Pavlov then did was to ring a bell and then feed them, and after a while, the dogs salivated to the bell as well as to the food. So they, they'd hear a bell and expect to be fed. Now, one day that did lead to a big problem in Pavlov's laboratory when the doorbell rang and one of the dogs ate the UPS man. <laughs> Moving along. So... If you have memory loss after a stroke, you may have confusion or problems with short-term memory. You may wander or get lost in familiar places and may have difficulty following instructions or trouble making monetary transactions. You may end up putting out a handful of money and letting the person behind the counter take the appropriate money. You can't really figure out exactly how to count the money. Now, memory can improve over time, either spontaneously or through rehabilitation, but symptoms can last for years. Now, uh, our old friend. Neuroplasticity. Thankfully, the brain has a certain amount of plasticity. That means that the brain can reorganize itself. If part of the brain was damaged by stroke, the brain can learn to use different parts to carry out the tasks that were once assigned to those parts. Amazing. Is that also true of short-term memory? Uh, I, yeah, sort of. You can yes. use things like one of the most common suggestions for a better short-term memory is to use mnemonics. Mnemonics. Mnemonics is a technique of attaching a word, phrase, or image to an object. One example of mnemonics is a trick to remember how many days there are in a month. 30 days, half September, April, June, and November. That allows you to do that. And the rhyming helps, too. Yes, it does. It also helps to stimulate your brain. That helps you form memories. You try taking up a new hobby. Exercise. And I'll return to this in a minute. Because the fitter you are physically, the fitter you will be mentally. Use memory cues. Like link the thing you want to remember to a familiar name or song. I often do that to remember people's names. I have a difficult time remembering people's names. There's someone here in our condo association named Dennis, and I remember it by calling him Dennis the Menace. <laughs> Doing activities that engage your brain, like Sudoku and crossword puzzles, and reading in general can help improve your memory. Whoop. Losing your short-term memory is stressful. We can learn to lessen the stress by learning to cope with it. Here are some suggestions. Stick to a routine. That way it becomes a motor memory and you just do it automatically. Leave yourself notes to remind yourself to do things like checking the gas on your stove before you leave the house. Or make lists of chores you need to do. Of course, my wife likes to make those lists for me. <laughs> <laughs> also 
always store things like your glasses in the same place. That way going to it becomes a motor memory. Set up direct debits for bills so you don't forget to pay them. Label your bags and sweaters in case you forget them. Like summer camp. Right. <laughs> also, you can find that certain medications or alcohol, lack of sleep, or poor nutrition, and stress make your memory loss worse. So keep tabs on what affects you. And if you haven't been sleeping well and complain about memory loss, get better sleep and uh, cut out the alcohol. That can affect your brain and cause Korsakoff syndrome where you can't form new memories. Really? Yes. Hmm. Uh, the most rapid recovery from memory loss usually occurs in the first three to four months. But many survivors continue to recover years after their stroke. So don't give up. Finally, there's a recent study that was published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health. Tracked data from 4,500 people in the United Kingdom with activity monitors strapped to their thighs for 24 hours a day. The results show that doing moderate and vigorous exercises and activities were linked to much higher cognition scores, including short-term memory, than in people who spent most of their time sitting, sleeping, or doing gentle things. And these were not people that had had a stroke. These were just normal, everyday people. But shows that doing vigorous exercise will help improve your short-term memory. So presumably, that would help someone who had a stroke recover their short-term memory. Vigorous exercise generally includes things like running, swimming, biking up an incline, and dancing. Meta exercise includes brisk walking, and it even gets your heart beating faster. In all this regard, a former doctor of mine had a sign in his office that read, exercise is the answer to everything. So and like more exercise they do, the better the person is to regain his memory. Yes, that should be the case. That has not been studied specifically in someone with memory loss, but it has been studied in people without memory loss and their short-term memory has improved as a result. So presumably it would also happen in someone who lost memory because of a stroke. Well, so that, that concludes my presentation, but I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so that's, you know, we're back to exercise is the answer to everything. Yes. yes. Get to everything, uh, everything going, everything flowing. Right. And, you know, we weren't... <laughs> We didn't grow up, but, you know, we didn't evolve behind computers. We used to um, have to forage for food and keep ourselves alive and be a lot more active than we are these days. And that is the truth. So it's something that society fights, not just stroke survivors. And I can't imagine that if, um, you know, techniques work, um, of exercise techniques work on people who haven't had a stroke. I mean, it's the way the brain works. I can't imagine they wouldn't work um, if you if you uh, suffered a stroke. Might be a little more challenging, depending if you got some kind of damage going on, but the basic mechanism would have to still be there. I don't think stroke changes our brain all that much. No, the, the mechanism would be the same. So... Exercise should help. What about the person that has been ridden? Well, how do they get their exercise like that to a caregiver only in the only certain time of the day? Well, uh, again, the more exercise, the better, but passive exercise will also help. Passive exercise is a situation in which someone else moves your limbs for you. So that could be done vigorously by a caregiver or a nurse 
or, or physical therapist, and that would help improve you. There are a lot of things you can do in bed too. Uh, we just did a thing, a uh, 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 talk on bed exercises. One of the best things you can do if you have a caregiver is um, bicycling. You get the survivor to lay on their back, put their feet up, and you move their legs like they're on a bicycle. And it works real good. It's fairly easy to do unless they've got a really stiff leg. In which case, it's one of the things that you can use to um, kind of try and undo that. But there, there's lots more than people think that can be done in the bed. Uh, if you got use of your hand at all, you can do uh, bridges and clamshells and uh, planks and things. Oh, planks are a little tough. Things like that. Uh, snow angels. I mean, there's lots of things that you can do in the bed. Get moving and keep moving is the secret. Yeah. Anything else? All right, somebody else, so I don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> somebody out there has got to have questions. <laughs> <clears throat> What happens if you don't have short memory? How does it go into long memory? Well, it can't get into long-term memory, but it can get out of long-term memory back into short-term memory. So, so basically, if you lose your short-term memory, you'll have no memory at all. Uh, no, well, you lose the ability to form a short-term memory. Okay. See, the, the area of your brain that you're currently aware of or that allows you to think of things and, and allows you to say things that are stored in your long-term memory will still be functioning. So you'll still be able to retrieve things from the past and talk about them. Right. You can't say, form any new ones. Say you want to make new you won't form any new ones because you won't have any more short-term memory. So there'll be no memory at all, basically. Well, there's no new memory. It's like you're waking. It's like you're always waking up. You would have forgotten what happened five or ten minutes earlier. It's like you're always awaking from sleep. You can remember what you did ten years ago, but you can't remember five minutes earlier. So so basically what I'm, I'm thinking is you have no input of the recent memory. Say you have a, a, mem a recent memory of a week or a, a, a snapshot of a week. So you have no recent memory of that. So how could it become a long-term memory if the input of the recent memory doesn't work? You can't form a new long-term memory. Okay, so there'd be no long, yeah. So basically, right. you become a blank person. Yes, but you can have an old um, long-term memory. Right. But, but fortunately, um, most of the people I see with short-term memory loss, uh, it's patchy. It's not like complete. It's not like they're, it's wiped out completely. It's like um, comes and goes. They have ability. Sometimes it seems like they have the ability to remember some things and not other categories of things, that that kind of thing. Um, so it, I've never maybe, seen anybody with like a complete, you know, shut off of. Maybe that's what, what he's saying is there's different mem memory types, motor memory. Right. Visual memory. So maybe those those inputs are working. Yes, your motor memory would still be working. You could learn a new skill. You just can't remember that you learned it. Right. You can do it. You just can't remember. You can't it. remember doing it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's odd. And there are other types of, uh, and I've never heard of this following a stroke, but it, it can happen. It's, it's sort of like you lose the application. Yes. It is possible to... Uh, have brain damage in which you lose all the past events 
in your life that you remember doing your personal memories let's say uh i'm just making this up. let's say you can remember that you went to disneyland when you were five years old but you can't remember actually doing anything yourself at disneyland all those personal episodes in your life have vanished but you remember the general thing that happened. And that's very rare in the scientific literature. But it, it's possible to have odd uh, problems like that. Hmm. That would suck, because all those memories cost me a fortune. <laughs> you mean the casino? <laughs> no, no, going to Italy, and, you know, all, all the things that you do in this world. Sure. You know, we take a lot of time to have um, experiences and travel and create memories. That's what life is all about, I thought. Yes. Making more memories. So. Yeah, the first international trip I took my wife to was to Italy. Where'd you go? We went to a scientific conference in Milan. Okay. But in addition to that... Um, uh, they drove everyone at the conference up north to Lake Como, and we had a meal there, Lake Como. Lake Como. We also went to uh, Florence and to Venice. Wow, all the way over to Venice. Yes. Well, that's probably the only major city in, Eng in England. In Italy, I haven't um, been to. I'd love to go to Venice and then go to, uh, on a cruise uh, down the Baltic states. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I went to Milan a couple times and up to the Lake Country, Lake Cuomo. Um, the Borromeo Castle is pretty fabulous. Anyway, yeah, I'd hate to lose all those things. I can actually close my eyes and see a picture of a mosaic I took in that castle and the white peacocks and the gardens and wow. life would really life would really be bad without all. Those That's basically why memories. you take pictures. Yes, that is true. That's why people take pictures for memories. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if I take a picture, I see it pretty much forever. Yeah. In fact, I don't even have to. We were doing a project recently, and my friend said, do we have these pictures? And she started flipping through it. I could tell her which ones I'd seen before and which ones I hadn't. Yeah. But, you know, I got a visual brain. Mm -hmm. That's so where's your next thing. trip, Dr. Hetzler? Uh, I don't have one planned now. Uh, that okay. one, uh, uh, it was a scientific conference, and I'm now retired from, at Lawrence, and I'm retired from the uh, uh, scientific uh, societies that I belong to. I was a member of the International Society for Biomedical Research on Alcoholism for 40 years, from wow. 1980 till uh, 2020, and went to so, with my wife to several uh, alcoholism conferences. Uh, we went to one in Yokohama, Japan, and the uh, uh, most recent one was 2010 uh, in Paris. That was a year before my stroke. Do they serve alcohol? Oh, you better believe it. In fact, when we got off the plane and arrived, uh, we arrived in Tokyo and then a bus ride to Yokohama, there was a reception there. And uh, the only thing we could find was alcohol. It was an alcohol <laughs> conference. Finally, there was a vetting machine where they had uh, 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 cold cans of uh, coffee. So we could get that, but that that was pretty weird. Uh, a lot yeah. of alcohol at the Alcoholism Conference. Yeah, I kind of expected you to say not really, but I'm not surprised. There, there was a lot there. Uh, especially in Paris. I don't know if the French can have a meal without drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that it was fun. It was a blast. We had a lot of fun there. And uh, you never know where you're going to be recognized. 
Now, I don't know if people in this group know, but before my stroke, I was a magician in addition to uh, being a college professor. I mentioned that because when my wife and I were done with the conference in Yokohama, uh, we took a bus ride uh, back to Tokyo and we were sitting in the Tokyo airport waiting to get on our plane, just sitting there in the terminal. And all of a sudden I hear, it's the magician from BJ Clancy's. <laughs> that was a restaurant where I was doing table side magic at the time. No. And a man who'd been there many times and had seen me was with a church group that had flown to China to adopt children. They were bringing them back to the States going through the Tokyo airport. So he recognized me and I had a deck of cards on me. So I took that out and did some card tricks for them. Wow. Most of the time I've been recognized, it was uh, twice it's happened. And in both cases, I wasn't exactly sure who the person was. I'm sure their name, wasn't sure how I knew them. It's always interesting to try and fake a conversation like that and not let them know you have no idea who you're talking to. <laughs> Maybe they were talking to the wrong person. Maybe. I've got like some lookalikes or something. I've never seen anybody who looks like me, but people tell me all the time I met you before. So you've got a doppelganger. I don't know. Yeah, the one... So now the lady on the elk hunt in Montana, I said, I haven't been in Montana since I was nine years old. I don't hunt. I wouldn't be on a video shoot, even though on an elk hunt, she kept insisting it was me. <laughs> I don't think I look like that many people, but oh, well, somebody out there does. <laughs> I, I get it all the time. Don't I know you? <laughs> Wait, Dr. Hasler, I want yes. to ask you a question. If you had a memory of maybe like frying an egg before you have a stroke and now you get the stroke, right? Can you remember today frying your egg and know what to follow after you fry your egg? You could, you could remember the motor memory. You could do it. You would not remember how you learned it, or you may not remember where you did it in the past, but you could still do it. From start to finish. Presumably, yes. Okay. Yeah, this is an interesting thing, because we talk about, you know, mo motor memory, and, and yet we don't really, I mean, we do in some senses, but you have a stroke and you're sitting there in a wheelchair and, you know, you're looking at your, your side that doesn't work and and there's not really we do everything instantly so there's not like any you, you can't call on like a program on how, how did i used to move this arm you have to look at the other one and um so i find that kind of interesting that, that we have motor memory but we don't really have a map of how we do everything because it's all right. brains just doing it instantly like fixing your bed, taking the sheets off and putting it back on. Yes. That's it, a motor memory. You just do it. You don't remember when you learned it or anything, but you just do it. Or, or like playing tennis, if you learned to play tennis before your stroke, if you had the physical abilities afterwards, you could do it. You just couldn't remember learning to play tennis. Okay. The, the more right. I hear, the more I hear this stuff, the more I, I relate the brain to all these different apps that are happening. When you lose this app, it doesn't work now. That's right. what it looks like. Billy's kind of an IT guy, so he thinks in terms of uh, apps yeah. and computers and RAM and 
Uh, actually, a pretty good analogy. I mean, the brain is basically the most complicated computer we got on Earth, so yeah, it's, uh... it's not unlikely. So too bad you can't get a new short-term memory. Slide it in, take that bad one out, and slide a new one into that slot. But they'll be able to do that someday. Right. Probably. And the brain has got 100 million neurons. And I used to tell my students they shouldn't worry about that number because I would not expect them to learn any more than half of them by name. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and there are all kinds of fascinating uh, types of neurons. I recently learned about mirror neurons and empathy, and yeah. they're pretty fascinating. Well, actually, there's a theory of autism. It's called the broken mirror theory. That is, people with autism don't seem to have functioning mirror neurons. Now, many of you probably aren't quite sure what we're talking about in terms of mirror neurons. And they were first discovered actually in Italy, uh, Ralph, um, in the 1990s. Scientists were recording from neurons in a monkey's brain. And they found neurons that would become active when the monkey picked up a raisin and put it in its mouth. Hmm. But then those same neurons, it turned out, were active when the monkey saw a researcher picking up a raisin and putting it in his mouth. That is, they were active not only when the monkey did it, but when the human did it. The Sorry. monkey's response seemed to mirror what was going on, as if you were seeing someone else in a mirror, do something. And that began a lot of research on these so-called mirror neurons. And you use your mirror neurons if you uh, say someone's walking in front of you and you see them get hit in the head by a Frisbee. You go, oh, you sort of feel their pain yourself, even though you weren't hit. Those are your neurons. Right. They also and, um, end up, they believe they end up uh, partially responsible for your, well, like getting hit in the head with a fris frisbee, identifying with what's going on with other people, being able to put yourself in other people's uh, situations and places. Empathy. Showing empathy, showing empathy. And it turns out, Autistic people don't display that empathy that non-autistic people have. Well, and that so, would account for it because from what I know, um, typically they find those mirror neurons developing in humans around five or six years old. And that's about the time that uh, autism starts presenting. Or you become aware of it. Maybe it maybe it's presented earlier, and the child just isn't sufficiently developed to the point where you could tell what's going on with them. That would that's um, this is fascinating stuff. The brain. We're going to see a lot of changes in the next. Well, I don't know. If I'll be here long enough, but there will be a lot of changes in the next twenty or thirty years. Let's put it that way. I don't know. If I'll be here. We're not going anywhere. Hundred. Not going anywhere. In 30 years, I'll be 103 if I'm That's alive. Okay. Yeah, I'd be okay as long as I got a brain still. <laughs> right. You know, my mom had dementia for the last five years of her life. So that's, you know, always a big, I wouldn't say fear, concern. I try and, you know, what can I do about it? I don't know. You know, you, know, you can, I, I could already have been dealt a bad hand. I could still fight it. I still do the things that I need to do to try and stay active. That exercise, Ralph. Yeah. Exercise. I do, I do some, you know, brain games too. I add up all the stuff in the supermarket and guess the, um, guess the total at the cash register, usually within 50 cents, always within 50 cents, or I know something's wrong actually. 
I started doing it because they don't always have the things in the computer right. So, yeah, and there's lots of things you can do. You mentioned some Sudoku, crossword puzzles, um, jigsaw puzzles are also pretty good. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, slow wave sleep, stages three and four of sleep seem to be stages in which the brain is cleaned. There are channels in the brain that open up during stages three and four of sleep, and neurons are basically washed with cerebrospinal fluid, and that clears out tau protein and beta amyloid protein, things that are involved in Alzheimer's disease. So if another way to help uh, uh, prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease is get a good night's sleep in which you get, uh, uh, in particular, stages three and four of sleep. There are some trackers. Uh, my wife has a Fitbit tracker that records how much time she spends in slow wave sleep, REM sleep, and, and waking. So uh, that can help. Yeah, I, my my phone does too. Somewhere here. Uh, so the neurons. There's different types of neurons. Yeah, the mirror neuron. There are a lot of different types of neurons. Now, yes. how, now how does the um say they say that neurons could regrow and you know modify the, to the brain? Is there neutral neurons that become? That you can make them, uh, a, you know, memory neuron, or how does that work? Is that well? Uh, there are some parts of the brain, a few, in which new neurons are born. Um, okay. And there's there needs to be more research on that. Um, yeah. So, so basically, they, they, the neurons are reborn to that typical location that it needs it. It's like replacing. Well, no, uh, they, they, they seem, and again, I'm not up to date on all that research, yeah. but they, they can migrate from where they're born to where they're needed. Wow. But they, you know, they, to, to, to get them there, again, exercise is the main thing. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, do they learn that function then at that point? In other words, That's the hope. Again, that research is in its infancy. So that's something they need to research, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they've been finding out that stem cells basically um, don't turn into anything. They, if they have a positive effect, it seems to be in helping generate um, new neurons as opposed yeah, to. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you there, Ralph. You no, gotta so be Real careful as far as stem cells. Don't go to any of these clinics and say, yeah, for $30,000, we'll take some of your stem cells and inject them into you and you'll be a lot better. <laughs> um, what they're doing is taking peripheral stem cells from like your fat or something and then injecting them in your arm and say, yeah, they'll get your brain. And that's a lot of BS. Yeah, there's a little something called the blood-brain barrier that you know all about. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, the only ones who've really had much success are people like Stanford, where they drill a hole in your head and they put them, they, they kind of like put them where they, you know, sort of where they need to be. Exactly. They drill a hole in your head and then insert a long needle in your brain to the core of where your stroke was. And that seems to help, but it turns out it's not because of the stem cells regrowing in there or something, but they release chemicals, right. stimulate other neurons to, to reattach. So again, don't, don't spend any money on someone taking stuff from your fat and injecting it in your arm and expecting it to reach your brain. That's a lot of gobbledygook. Yeah, there's no such thing as liquid brain, huh? Right. <laughs> like liquid chicken. Right. <laughs> anyway. 
is there any particular exercises you can use do, use for your brain? That's a good Here's question. Just do it over and over and over again. You think it's likely the blood, something have to do with blood flow as well? Uh, I'm not up to date on that. I couldn't answer that. Okay, well, that's a fair answer. If you don't know, you don't know. Um, you know, because the first thing you think about is, you know, all the happy chemicals and that kind of thing. But I was just wondering if, you know, serotonins and things like that. Um, I was just wondering if, well, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the brain's the thing that uses the most oxygen in your body. So having a good blood flow to your brain certainly isn't a bad idea. Oh, no, that's, that's true. In fact, fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance imaging, looks at oxygen levels in different parts of your brain. And what the oxygen is really measuring is blood flow. That is increases in blood flow to that area. So if you've ever had an fMRI that's looking at increased blood flow as indicated by increase in oxygen use in that area. I, I haven't, but I've seen those scans and they, they tend to show, um, well, the way they represent them is they show different colors for increased and decreased blood flow in the area. And you actually see usually where like, if it's a, a, a clot, you can usually see like where the clot is because everything downstream of that is is colored. And I've also seen them where they they monitor those dynamically so they can see like, um, I seen them like before and after the clot buster, for example. So okay. you can see that the you can actually see that the blood is uh, flowing better than it had been. So, Good. yeah, I mean, like I said, next twenty or thirty years, we're going to be doing a lot more going up in there and grabbing clots and doing all all kinds of uh, of things. Technology is wonderful, and strokes suck. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well. You know, I always yeah. say we're all a member of a club we wish we didn't belong to. Yes. All hey, right. Tommy. Winnie, you got any more questions or anybody else? Billy? Yeah. So, well, I, yeah. Don't, I don't have a question, but I have a comment, some comments. Sure. Go ahead, Martha. Um, so this discussion sounds eerily similar to some of the literature I read about Alzheimer's. Hmm. My mother had Alzheimer's, and, and it was it was interesting and disturbing to see how her short term memory and long term memory started to go. Well, it, Alzheimer's it, disease uh, affects a lot of the brain, but in particular, it affects uh, the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. So when the hippocampus is damaged, you can't perform new memories. And the cerebral <laughs> cortex is where those memories are stored. And as that degenerates, you lose the memories. My mom had vascular dementia, not Alzheimer's. And she, uh, oh, she can remember everything from her childhood and such, but she wasn't present in the present yeah. very much. She couldn't. Yeah. Uh, most, most of the time when I saw her, I was her sister. Yeah, that happens too. Yeah, and she we would talk. She would talk about all the things we did when we were little. My mom went to Duke University, so she used, she was in a uh, assisted living center in Connecticut. But she started her day every day at Duke University, and then had lunch in Williamsburg, Virginia, where they lived for a while. But she had to get back to Connecticut by three p.m. every day to uh, get the boys off the bus. I'm one of four boys. And uh, we were all in our 50s at this time, of course. Um, so we weren't getting off the bus. But they, you know, they say meet them where they are because they tend to live in the past. It was... And, Ralph, where were you in the birth order? Oldest, youngest, or in the middle? 
I was second, and my older brother was killed in a um, Navy uh, aircraft accident when he was, uh, when I was uh, 19, he was 23. So I've been the oldest for um, 50 years. I'm sorry about your brother. I, I mentioned birth order because there are studies showing that uh, if you plot IQ, that is intelligence quotient, over birth order, you find that the oldest has the highest IQ and it gradually declines with birth order. So your older brother, theoretically, and of course it can vary from family to family, would be the smartest and the fourth born would have a lower, the lowest IQ of the four of you. That's just in general terms and may not apply to an individual family, but yeah, since the youngest is teaching calculus at George Mason University. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't remember how to write a functional equation. Um, um, no, we were all uh, college board scores and differential aptitude tests and things like that would indicate we we're fairly um, even, definite. Um, uh definite skills in math all of us and uh, although my older brother was pretty good in english as well he was probably more english math balanced than uh, the other three of us come from an engineering family so my dad was like you know total engineer total so then my I'm other the oldest now so i'm the smartest <laughs> right. and, my, and my other comment was so when I fell asleep during a, a college lecture I wasn't really sleeping I was studying I was making up my long term memories oh. I was studying for my test not sleeping hmm. okay how'd you do I did well. Oh. Good. Theory would say, she's, well, Dr. Hetzel's little um, example uh, was, uh, or study was that people did better if they slept. Yes. So maybe, maybe you should study up right before you go to sleep, huh? <laughs> Actually, that's what I used to do when I was in college. I would. Uh, study for a couple hours and then go to, right to bed and in the morning i'd remember it very very well it's like anything in life there's strategies for how to maximize things if you pay attention a lot yeah. of this, a lot of the stroke recovery stuff is just paying attention to what's going on with you trying different things seeing how they work focusing on the ones that work and trying to make them into a routine So very basic. Very right. basic, Al. It's very basic. Yep. All right. Well, oh, Diane snuck in. Uh, and I didn't say hi to Simone. And I didn't say hi to Carly. So uh hi everybody. And um, unless anybody's got anything else, I guess we ought to let Dr. Hetzler go and and uh, that was very good, Dr. Hessler. Well, thank you very much. I hope it provided some interesting information for you. Thank you, Dr. Hessler. Yes, I have a question. So I heard you guys, and I've read somewhere, and I heard from other sources that sleep is very important for the brain. Yes. And for some reason, I can't sleep at night. I dance in my bed because the pain and everything. My bed is like I go from my back to my side. And I just can't sleep, so I worry now. Well, I don't blame you for worrying. I, 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 I don't. I can't offer a suggestion. I would talk to your primary care physician about what you might be able to do. Um, you might consider spending a night in a sleep lab, so they can. Uh, uh, look at your brain waves and body movements and so on over the course of a whole night and see what they suggest in the morning. 
So I was going to have this test. It's called ECG and it was going to be done at home too. The doctor wanted to see how my brain is functioning. Sure. But unfortunately with the crazy insurance, they only going to pay 70% and the rest I would be responsible for, which right now between the PT, which I had to cancel because I'm down to $10,000 in debt and I'm in collection agency. So I, I had to cancel everything. Well, it sucks. And this it government, really I say, sucks. the government's got to straighten out. And I try to be very busy throughout the day. Like I make almost 6,000 steps every day, you know, doing things. And I'm into more cooking these days and thinking I'll be tired enough to just lay in bed and just fall asleep right away. But it just doesn't happen. Do you have a uh, jumpy legs, your affected side jump, like your leg? No. No? What, just what about restlessness? It's just my hips and my left shoulder blade is just killing me. So I go to bed and I lay on my right side and then I get tired. So I have to lay on my back and then I have to switch back to my right side. So I, like I said, I dance in my bed. So you, you, you don't lay on your affected side at all? No. Is your shoulder? I can't even like turn on my left side. So it's hard. It'll come. Uh, that would be, I found that by sleeping on my left side, um, that put the, I had jumpy legs and jumpy leg more my left. And I found that by sleeping on my left side that it, kind of pinned it down and kept it from moving around so much when it was on top it was free to do whatever it wanted and it did yeah. whatever it wanted so uh, I, I would i would check with your doctor and see if you can prescribe some kind of sleeping medicine well you gotta be careful with that now, i sleep on my back every night so oh, i don't i don't sleep on my right or left side oh. i did before my stroke but since I'm, I've always slept just on my back. I guess from all that dancing and everything, I sometimes I end up on my back, and I I think that's how I usually fall asleep. You might just start out on your back and yeah. on my back completely the entire night. If you talk to my neuro massage therapist, he says you should sleep on your back with a pillow behind your knees. I see. Kind of your knees kind of half bent up. Yeah. Um, I can't do it. I can't go to sleep that way. Occasionally I wake up that way, but I never spend more than half an hour or an hour in that position. I'm going to try because I'm just, so the other day my younger daughter comes to the room and she's like, mom, what, what happened to your bed? <laughs> I said, I danced all night in my bed. <laughs> I mean, there's some natural things like melatonin is fairly mm -hmm. natural that you might try if you haven't tried uh, that. Uh, lavender. Bre yeah, lavender. Um, breathing, meditation. You were coming to the breathing class for a little while. I do a lot of breathing hey, actually, when yeah, you I were lay saying like that because it, it actually I noticed that it's it's even better when you lay and you... When you inhale, I, I can inhale more than just sitting. And then I can exhale for longer than when you sit. So I actually found it laying in the bed and do the breathing is better than sitting. So I do that every day. <laughs> well, I'm I out of check. suggestions. <laughs> I would check with your doctor to see if you could take some sleeping aids. Yeah. Just to, just to try that out. You know, you could do it for a week um, because sometimes. Um, well, you have to be careful about taking drugs to sleep. Now, over the counter ones tend to be antihistamines. Yeah. yeah. And they have as a side effect drowsiness. But I would be very careful about getting a physician prescribed sleep aid. Yeah. It can often have unwanted side effects or be addictive. So. Yeah. I would, if you want to try something like over the counter. For sure, because I don't want to take even more medication than I'm already taking. Because what is it? What else is it going to affect in my in my body? Like in a few years, what's going to happen to me? Who knows?
what is this medication does for me anyway? I can tell you from personal experience, Ambien will put you to sleep for about four hours. And then once you wake up, you'll never, ever go back to sleep again. <laughs> so uh, that that didn't work. I They took me off uh, antidepressants that so they put me on that probably caused my stroke. Was after 16 days, uh, I got in the hospital. They took me off and I wasn't sleeping again. The only thing that really worked was uh, Tramadol or Tramazine. God almighty, I told them that I would fight a dozen nurses if they ever tried to stuff one of those down my throat again. Should try some lavender. Yeah. That's natural. Um, gentle um, music. Yeah. Yeah, you can get apps for your cell phone. You know, the, I think it's one called Calm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things. You know, like a heartbeat or some or a brain. Yeah, wow. that's what a lot of people do. They just listen to those and that. Yeah. Ocean waves, splashing brooks. Anything but fighter jets. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I got one. I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Hasler, how yes. does um, sleep relate to memory? Uh, well, memories are often formed during sleep. And you're more likely to remember something if after you practiced it, you go to sleep rather than doing something else. So uh, uh, sleep helps memory formation. And in that time, you can exercise your brain. Well, you, you're not exercising your brain when you're asleep. You're cleaning it and storing things. Mm -hmm. During sleep, the brain reorganizes itself and it's cleaned. So sleep is very beneficial. All right. Well, I guess we'll thank you again, Dr. Hetzler. It's always a pleasure. We it's appreciate it. And uh, so do all the people who tune in on YouTube. Okay. Well, thank you all. And thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.